Hello friends, so good to be back with you. We wanna welcome everybody who's watching online right now. We know that there's a lot of people that can't be here in person with us today. And so we are so blessed to have you online connecting with us. You are part of our Harvest family online and we just want you to know today we love you and we are so excited to have church with you. Um, we're about to worship together. I wanna to remind you that in God's presence, there is fullness of joy. In God's presence, when we come into his presence, there is joy unspeakable. I don't know what kind of week you've had. I don't know if it's been good or bad or somewhere in between, but I know this, when we come together to worship God, God's presence is not limited by our location. So wherever you're at, I want you to worship with us this morning. We're gonna worship together and we're gonna believe God to minister to you right now. Would you worship with us? Thank you for joining us online.
asking away Cause when you speak, when you move, when you do what only you can do, He changes us, He changes what we see, what we see. And when you come in the room, when you do what only you can do, He changes us, He changes different places with different emotional states and I really just want to ask you how you're doing because I know this that in the midst of everything going on the Bible tells us we can still have peace and I just want to encourage you with this thought this morning that in the midst of the chaos you can still have peace um, and it may not be feel natural right away it's something we're going to have to fight to hold on to and fight to have is the peace of God but it's a promise that we have, that we can have the peace of God. And this week I was thinking about a story I read years and years and years ago. It was a story of a king who wanted the perfect picture of peace. And so he sent out a contest across the kingdom to see who could paint the perfect picture of peace. And so many artists tried, and it came down to two pictures. One picture was a calm lake, the kind of lake where you look at it and it mirrors what is on the sky. You could see the mountains. You could see the white, fluffy clouds. It was just calm, quiet, and peaceful. Many people thought this has to be the, the winner. And then the other picture the king looked at was the complete opposite. It was this rugged mountain with the backdrop of a dark, stormy sky, lightning in the backdrop, storms, a rugged waterfall that just fell down the mountain that you could tell it was loud and vicious. And as people looked, they couldn't understand how this could be the picture of peace. And the king chose this picture because when you looked deep past the waterfall, in the midst of the cracks of the rock, there was one bush that was growing out. And in that bush, a mother bird had built a nest and was quietly, peacefully sitting on that nest. And the king said, this is the picture of peace. In the midst of this angry, chaotic atmosphere, this picture is peace. The king said, it, peace does not mean to be in a place where there is no noise. There's a lot of noise right now. Peace does not mean to be in a place where there's no trouble or problems or chaos. Peace means to be in the midst of all of those things and still be calm in your heart. And that is such a true meaning of peace. And so I feel like just reminding us, that's our assurance this morning, that we can have peace even in the midst of uncertainty, even in the midst of the chaos that is swirling on all around us. We can have peace. We can have peace in the midst. And I just want to remind you what 1 Peter 5, 7 says, casting the whole of your care, and this is in the Amplified, casting the whole of your care, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns, once and for all, on Him. And He cares for you affectionately, and He cares about you watchfully. Just know that God is watchfully. He has His eye on you watchfully. He's thinking about you. He cares about you. But are you feeling burdened this morning? Are you feeling heavy? Are you feeling weary? Isaiah 61, 3 says that he gives us the garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. And some of you just need to fight to make that exchange at the cross this morning. To say, I don't want to be heavy. I don't want to be weary. I need to exchange that. So we're going to take a minute as a church and we're going to pray. Because at, at this point, I don't have a lot of answers except I just know what the Word of God says. And I just know that prayer 
matters. And so as a church, we have to be praying. We have to be believing. And so this is going to be something that we are going to be intentional about, which is just together, when we're together, pray. We're going to pray and ask God for those of us who are feeling a lack of peace, that as we pray, I just believe that God's peace is going to rest on you. But Philippians 4, 6 says, don't worry about anything. Think about that. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. So what we're doing in this moment is we're taking all of our worries and we're going to channel them into our prayers and we're going to pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. So we're going to go before the Lord with our needs, but we're also going to have thankful hearts and gratitude because we recognize God is still moving in the midst. And then it says, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And I don't know about you, but a lot can be happening in my mind right now and in my heart if I um, let it. But to think that the peace of God, says, God says, I want to protect you. I want to go before you and I want to guard your mind and your heart. And so we're going to pray and we're going to find God's peace this morning. But as we do, as we go to the Lord, as we pray, I just want to challenge you to engage in this moment. I mean, if you don't hear a word I say, that's perfectly fine. Go to the Lord and engage and pray and ask God. Tell him what you need and thank him for what you've done, he's done and ask him for his peace to flood over you. I don't want you to passively agree. I want you to aggressively fight in your prayers alongside of me right now. And so right now, Heavenly Father, I just go before you along with my brothers and sisters. And we just ask you, Father God, that your peace would just rest, that we would look back in this moment of our church and that we would say we were people who were flooded by your peace, God. Lord, I just know right now that our church has people who have individual needs that are great and that they are um, can seem overwhelming in the natural, but Lord, we just lift them up right now. I lift up the finances of the people in our church. I thank you for those who are in need of a job, that a job is coming. Lord, I thank you that those who are having bills that are coming and they don't know how to how they're going to be able to deal with these bills, Lord, that you, Lord, are answering these concerns in their heart today, Father God. Lord, we lift up health. God, just even knowing as we pray right now that we have church family members who have lost loved ones, God. Lord, would you just flood them and comfort them and let them know how loved and how beloved they are and that their church family is lifting them up in our prayers. God, for those who are fighting serious health issues right now, Lord, please, right now, we just lift those up and we ask, would you touch them? Would you heal them? Thank you, Father, that you have the healing touch. We thank you for emotional well-being. Lord, that we are in control of our emotions and that as we, Lord, stand on your word and your peace floods through us, God, that anxiety and fear don't have a stronghold in our life. And God, as we look out into our community, God, we lift our community up and we just ask that you would protect our community. Lord, we ask that you would just keep our community safe in the midst of such unrest that's going on, that's sweeping the nation. Lord, would your hand just rest on our community and on our first responders and on everyone who is out there serving others. Lord, we just pray, Father God, that you would send people to encourage them, that you would just take care of them, that you would uh, protect them, Father. Lord, we lift our country up. Our country needs healing across so many different um, levels. We know, God, that only you can come in and disrupt what's going on. And so we're asking for your hand to fall, God. We need you, God. We need you. We need your power and your presence. And we need you to raise up leaders on every level, God. Lord, you do have answers for the division that is just in our country right now. You have the answer. You are the answer, Father God. And so, Lord, would you give us opportunities in our world to make a difference where we're at, Father God, and let us seize those opportunities. Lord, we are just recognizing our need for you. We are recognizing we are in a country that we are at a point where we need you, Father God. We need your healing, and we need your love, and we need your power. And so, God, I pray that 
those of us who call ourselves Christ followers would rise up in this moment, God. Lord, that you would light something within all of us, Father, and that you would show us, Father God, who you need us to be in this moment of history, Father. And God, I just thank you so much that you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. I thank you that, Lord, as we lay our cares before you, as we cast our cares upon you, you do care. You are watching over us. And, Lord, that we can rest on the promises that we find in your word. And so we do approach you with such gratitude in our hearts, such thankfulness that we serve a good God. You are so good, Father God. And thank you, Lord, that you are taking care of us and meeting our needs. Lord, we just, as a church, commit to praying more, to going before you, Father God, and to ask for your help, because in our own strength, we don't have the answers. We don't know what to do, but Lord, you do. And so, God, we um, declare our need for you, and we ask you to come be in our midst this morning, Father, in Jesus' name. Hi Harvest, thank you for worshiping with us. My name is Pastor Josh and it's my honor to greet you and welcome you to our Harvest online service this morning. If you are new or are checking us out for the first time, thank you for joining us. Um, we would love to connect with you and you could do so by going to our website harvestfamily.net and scrolling down to the bottom of the homepage and you'll see an option there to connect with us, the staff. We would love to get in contact with you and to hear from you. If you or your family are in need of prayer, please know that we are here and ready and willing to pray with you guys. You could um, fill out a prayer request form the same way. You go to our website harvestfamily.net, scroll to the bottom, you'll see an option to pray. And church, I also want to thank you for your faithful giving, for supporting the mission, for supporting the work here at Harvest. You're blessing the community, and you're blessing your fellow um, church members, and I just want to thank you guys so much. Um, but please know that you can still give online at harvestfamily.net, and you can also text to give by following the instructions right here below on the screen. Church, we love you. I want to wish you a happy, a happy Father's Day today, and I just pray that this message by Pastor Paul will bless you. God bless.
Well, hello everyone. Again, it is so good to be with you. Thank you for worshiping with us. And uh, I want to take a moment right now and wish everybody a happy Father's Day. Uh, today is Father's Day. We are back at church and this is such a wonderful time for us to be gathering together. If you're watching this online, thank you so much for spending some time with us. I have the privilege today of sharing God's word with you. And, um, you know, it's one of those things where on Father's Day, um, I always kind of struggle with what to preach. And I don't want it to sound like I'm just talking to fathers. But I, I do think today's message is timely for us, where we're at as a society, a culture, uh, the things that we're seeing. And one of the things I like to do is to try to find a, uh, a character in Scripture, a godly father that we can learn from. The good, the bad, the ugly, everything in between. And I've got a, a, a lesson today that I'm excited about um, on, the, on, on Noah. I want to preach on this subject of Noah on this Father's Day. Um, you know, think about Noah for just a moment. This dude is amazing what he did, what he went through. If, even if you don't go to church, most of you know Noah and the story of the great boat, the ark, and saving all the animals and his family and uh, you know, just a wonderful story, but there's a lot to Noah and what um, Jesus says about Noah and what we need to see about Noah. And so, you know, it's pretty amazing uh, to think what Noah accomplished in his life and what he went through. I, I was trying to put my mind, you know, get my mind wrapped around this this week and thinking about Noah and, and, and not just that he for decades builds this huge boat. Uh, they've never even seen rain before, but God tells them to build a boat. But I was thinking about all the animals, the, the, that every animal came two by two and, and what that must have been like. Um, we ha I got I to gotta tell you a little story. My family, finally, after 10 years, my children finally wore me down and they wore us down, Shekinah and I, and we broke down and got a cat this week. Actually, a couple, you know, maybe a little longer than a week, nine, 10 days ago. We got a cat and, you know, the kids are so excited. They love this cat and the cat's pretty awesome. I, don't tell them, but I actually kind of like the cat. But I cannot believe the sounds and I'll just say the smells that one little cat can make. It's shocking. This cat, I just, it's like my whole house is changed. There's mess everywhere. Uh, you know, things are just kind of like, oh my goodness. Uh, and we love this cat, but man, it is, it has changed some things. And it's just one little cat. Can you imagine Noah and all the animals, 40 days on a boat and all the things that happen. It just, it's crazy. This whole story is really crazy. But Noah built not just a boat. He built something with his life. And the question that I really want us to wrestle with today, and the question that I want to ask you today is, what are you building with your life? What are you building? And, and I want to take the life of Noah and use him as a godly example for us. This isn't just for dads today. This is for all of us. If you're a mom here today, this is going to be helpful for you. If you're a single person or a young person, you don't have kids, this is for you. It doesn't matter where you are. That's what's so great about God's word is the principles apply to all of us. And so I want to jump into the life of Noah. Now, before we get into the story of Noah for just a moment, Jesus says something that is very important for us about Noah. He says in Luke 17, Luke 17, verse 26, this is what Jesus says about Noah. He said, when the Son of Man returns, so Jesus is talking about when, when the Son of Man returns and comes back, um, there's a phrase we've been using around here a lot. We've been talking about it. In the last days, Pastor Josh preached an unbelievable message last week. Go back and listen to it, our Generation Sunday. And we talked about how in the last days, the Spirit of God will be poured out on all flesh and how there's signs that, that, you know, that Jesus gave us to know we're living in the last days. And Jesus says something here in reference to him coming back. He says, when the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in the days of Noah. Now think about that. The way it was in Noah's day, that's how it's going to be in our day. And it says, in those days, the people enjoyed banquets and parties and weddings um, up to the time that Noah entered his boat right up to the time the flood came and destroyed them all. 
So the flood was coming, destruction was coming, God's judgment was coming, but right up to that point, man, people were living life, they were marrying, they were partying, they were having fun, they were doing what they do right up to the point of destruction. Another uh, scripture says it was business as usual, just everybody doing what they do. But Jesus gives us some insight when he says it will be as it was in the days of Noah. And so Noah is a great man of faith, a great father. He lived a godly example for us. And we can look at his life as an example of how should we live in the days that we face. We're facing some interesting days right now. We're in difficult times right now. There's stuff happening all around us. And guess what? This isn't the first time in history that we've had tough times. This isn't the first time we've gone through something that people had to go through something. And so we're going through it. But, but God gives us hope through his scriptures and through godly people in the past. And so Genesis chapter 6, we see Noah. Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, it says this. This is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. And he walked with God and Noah had three sons. Noah had three sons, he had a family, and it says that he was a righteous man. How do we know he was righteous? Because he walked with God. One of the things I love about this right away is that our righteousness is not in our good works and everything that we do, although we need to do good things, but the righteousness is connected to who we walk with, that we walk with the Lord and we walk with Jesus and we walk with God. And so Noah is a righteous man, a blameless man in his generation. I hope it could be said of that, of me, that in my time and in my generation, Paul was a righteous man, not a perfect man, but a righteous man, that I walked with the Lord closely, that I, that I did my best to follow him and to walk with him and that he was blameless in his generation. That's what I want it to be said of me, just like it was in Noah. Now in Noah's day, it wasn't great. There's a lot of things here that we're going to see that just it's it's it, his time that Noah lived in was corrupt. Matter of fact, it was so bad. We're going to see here that, that it actually broke the heart of God, how bad um, it had gotten with the people and sin. And it says in Genesis chapter six, Genesis chapter six, verse five and six, it says, then the Lord observed. So God's looking out. He's watching. Then the Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth. And he saw that everything that they had thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. Think about that. You, you, we're only six chapters into the Bible. We're six chapters in and everything's evil, constantly evil. It says, so the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. And it broke his heart. In the New Living Translation, it says God's heart was broken. Not that he made people, but he was broken by what sin had done to the people. Adam and Eve had sinned, and just generations, a few generations later, everything was evil and everything was crazy. And it says in verse 11 of Genesis 6, Now God saw that the earth had become corrupt and was filled with violence. So the, wor the world is evil, it's corrupt, it's violent. Does that sound like today? Does that sound like something we're going through? And it says in verse 12, God observed all of this corruption in the world for everyone on earth was corrupt. Now, right in the middle of this corruption and evil, it says in Genesis 6, verse 8, it says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. That's a wonderful verse. That even in the middle of this corruption, in the middle of everything being evil, Noah found favor. The, the, the day that Noah lived in was wicked, it was evil, it was dark, and the Lord said he was, it, it broke his heart. That's how bad it was. But it says Noah, even in that type of society, found favor. Noah lived in a corrupt world, but Noah never became corrupted. Do you know that you and I can live in a dark world and in evil times and we can live uh, where we're surrounded by things and we don't have to become what we are surrounded by? Do you know that just like Noah, we can have favor in today. We can have favor on our lives when we walk righteously and blamelessly with the Lord every day. That, that we might live in a corrupt world, but you and I don't have to become corrupt. That we don't have to, uh, you know, fall into what our society says. We're, we're supposed to stand out. Matter of fact, the, the, the society and our world that we live in isn't supposed to corrupt us. We're supposed to influence it. That's what God's called us to do. 
That's why Romans 12, 2, it says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but be a new and different person with a fresh newness in all you do and think. The way we think, the things that we do, we're supposed to be different. And Noah was different. He stood out. Noah was a light in a dark world. Noah set the example for us on how we can live godly even in ungodly times. And so I want to just point a few things out. These are all things that we've heard before, but I feel like we really need to hear it again, especially now. You know, we can't get away from the basics. A few weeks ago, a few months ago, we talked about the essentials, the things that are most important for living. And we can never get away from the essentials spiritually. And there's some things that Noah does that I just want to remind us of today on this Father's Day, because I think it's going to help all of us. Here's one of the things that I want you to know about Noah and about being a godly person. I'm going to say a godly father, but just being a godly person. Number one is this, a godly father, a godly person lives a life of faith. A godly person is going to live a life of faith. It says in Hebrews 11, and if you remember, Hebrews 11 is the hall of faith. It is in the New Testament. It's where all the great heroes are, are reported and, and their stories of what they did in their time. And it says this about Noah in Hebrews 11, verse 7. By faith, by faith, Noah built the ship in the middle of dry land. Think about how crazy you have to be to build a ship in the middle of dry land. Can you imagine going out to the desert and going, you know what, this looks like a good place right here. There's no water. We don't even know what rain is. We've never seen it before. Let's build a boat. Crazy. But Noah, it says by faith. Why? Because he lived his life by faith. Not by what he sees, not by his surroundings, but by faith. By faith, Noah built the ship in the middle of dry land. His act of faith drew a sharp line between the evil and unbelieving world and the righteous of the believing world. As a result, Noah became intimate with God. So it says here that by faith he built a boat, but by faith he drew a line and, and it separated the evil world with the righteous world. He was considered righteous in walking with the Lord. And so here he is, and it says he became intimate with God. Do you know that when we live our lives by faith, there's a closeness and an intimacy we can have with God that we cannot have if we are not living by faith? I want to remind you again that in, in verse 6 of Hebrews 11, it says it is impossible to please God without faith. And so we have got to have faith if we're going to really live the life God's called us to live. This means our life should not be lived outside of faith. If you want to please God, if you want to have a life uh, that pleases the Lord, if you want to have a life um, that, that when we're living in evil times, we live a godly life, it's going to require faith. And right now, I just want to encourage you in your faith. All of us, it does, we need to be encouraged in our faith right now. If you don't live a life of faith, you're going to live a life of doubt and unbelief. If we don't live a life of faith, we're going to easily live a life of fear. And right now there's, there's so many things coming at us that if you don't keep your eyes on the Lord and if we don't live a life of faith, we, we're going to fall to fear and we're going to fall to the things that we're seeing and it's going gonna, it's gonna to bring destruction to our hearts and our mind. But Noah didn't live by what he sees. He lived by faith. Noah's faith is what made him stand out from the rest of the world. I, I like that he stood out. I believe faith, when you really live your faith, I believe faith always makes you stand out. Dads, here you are, you're watching online, you know, here in church, we got fathers that are here. Here's the thing, when you live a life of faith, it causes you to stand out. Your children will see your faith. Your wife, your spouse, your family will see your faith. When we live a life of faith, your coworkers will see it. There's something about faith that causes us to stand out when we live for the Lord. And if we're going to be godly people, we have got to live by faith. As a result of Noah's faith, it says he became intimate with God. There is an intimacy with the Lord that we need more than ever. And we can't even begin to walk with the Lord if we don't first have faith. I want to encourage you, live a life of faith. Live a life of faith. Don't beat yourself up if you've struggled. Don't beat yourself up if you've blown it the last couple of weeks. Repent, come back to the Lord and live a life of faith again. Here's something else about Noah. 
that I've kind of already hit, but I want to point out. It says that he walked with the Lord. Godly people, a godly father, godly people will walk with the Lord. It says that he was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on earth at a time, at that time, and he walked in close fellowship with God. And as a result, we know of his faith, he became intimate with God. Noah walked in close fellowship with the Lord. You know, you can always tell a lot by who you walk with. It's interesting when I pick up my kids from school, back when they used to go to school, now we just, I just tell them to go to the room, and they do their homework or whatever. But when I used to pick the kids up at school, it's amazing you can see what kids were certain characters and certain types and personality types by who they walked with. You know, the guys that like to play sports are walking together. The girls that like talking and gossiping, they're over here. The other kids on the playground, they're here. Because there's something about who you walk with. It reveals something. How closely are you walking with the Lord today? These are, these are days that we need to be walking closely with the Lord. Not only that, but think about it. God loves you and me so much. He loves us. He's saying, I want to walk with you. I want to be with you. I, I want to daily, not just sometimes, but daily, I want, I want to walk with you and walk with you through life and through the problems and through the things that are coming. And Noah walked closely with the Lord. Look at what Leviticus 26 says. Leviticus 26, verse 11, it says this. God says, I will live among you and not despise you. I will walk among you and be your God and you shall be my people. That's a powerful verse that God says, I want to walk with you. I want to, I want to spend time with you. I'm going to live among you. I'm going to be with you. You will be my people and I will be your God. Have you ever stopped to think about that? That when you woke up today, God says, will you let me walk with you today? I love how when Jesus showed up, one of the first things he did is he started inviting people to walk with him. Come walk with me, he said. Come follow me. Come spend some time with me. Come do life with me. You know, here we are, and a lot of us are still inside our houses. We're coming out of quarantine, but some of us can't yet, and there's all these things, and we've been so separated from each other. But even in our loneliness, do you, in our loneliness, do you know there is someone that will never leave you nor forsake you? There is someone who wants to walk with you every day and be with you every day. The choice is not, does God want to walk with us? The real question is, do we want to walk with him? And Noah walked daily. Don't, don't just walk some days with God. Every day. Every day we need to walk with the Lord. You know, it's impossible to walk with somebody and not get close to them. I have found this out to be true uh, with the Lord and just with friends and people. One of the things our family uh, we love to do is we love to take walks at night. We go around our neighborhood, we go to the park. Shekinah and I, for years, you know, we love to take walks. Even with my in-laws, we'll, we'll take walks. And there's something about when you're walking together, there's a closeness, there's conversation, there's something happening where even if you're whispering, you're close enough that you can hear each other. Why? Because we're walking together. And so the Lord wants to walk with us and the Lord wants us to walk with him. Noah walked with the Lord daily. Here's another thing I find great about Noah's life. Is this, that a godly father or a godly person will receive his instructions from God's word and will obey it. One of the things that stands out to me about the life of Noah is that he received his instructions from God's word. He ins received his instructions from God himself. Literally, the words, the instructions came from the Lord and they came to Noah. But it's not that he just received it, he obeyed it. Remember, Noah's task was impossible, what God was asking him to do. He asked him, by all human standpoints and all human uh, measurements, this is an impossible task to build a, a boat that's larger than you know, almost two football fields in length and it's going to hold all the animals in the world. How is he supposed to do this? And he's, you know, and there's a storm coming that they've never seen before on the face of the earth. And, and Noah's supposed to build something like that. Um, the thing is, Noah got his instructions directly from the Lord. He didn't know how to build a boat like this. He didn't have the blueprint for something of this size and this magnitude. He had never experienced what was coming. And yet... God helped him. I don't know about you, but I feel like this a lot where I go, I don't have a blueprint 
for what I'm going through right now. I don't know what we're supposed to do. Or, or Lord, I don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to do next. And I've realized that I don't have to know what to do. I just need to know where to go. God's word already tells us what to do. God's word is already there for us. It's already there helping us every step of the way if we will just read it and know it and memorize it and get it into our hearts and our minds so that we can live it. This is what Noah did. He got the words and his instructions and directions from the Lord and then he obeyed it. I need the Lord's instructions for every day of my life, especially right now. I need the Lord's instructions on how to build my life right. I need the Lord's direction and the Lord's words on how to build my marriage right, how to build this church right. If you only knew the questions in the prayers I've had with the Lord going, I don't, Lord, I don't know what to do. How do we do this? God, help me. And I go to God's word and go to him in prayer. And then you start going, okay, Lord, thank you. And you get direction. God wants to give us direction for every part of our lives. You cannot build it if you're not willing to let God direct it. You've got to let the Lord give you directions for your life on how, because you can build your life the way you want, the way you think, or you can build it on God's word. And for the last several weeks, Shekinah and I have been beating this just over and over. Build your life on God's word. Build your life on God's word. That's what we're trying to do. And you know, you can build something and not look at the directions, but is what you're building going to last? You can build your marriage how you want. You can build your, your, your family up the way you want. You can build your business the way you want. But are you building on a foundation that when the storms come, and they will come, will it last? I remember when we were younger, my friends and I, we used to love to build skateboard ramps. If we could get any type of wood, just wood laying down, it could have 10 nails in it. We didn't care. Get it. It's free wood because we have no money. And we wanted to skateboard and ride our ramps. And I remember we built our first quarter pipe. This thing was amazing. It was horrible but it was amazing. We loved this stupid ramp, but you looked at it, it's all crooked. We didn't have any blueprints. We had no instructions. Man, this thing, we got like nails sticking out of it. We didn't care. It was our ramp and we were gonna ride it. We didn't know if the angles were right, didn't care. We just, we wanted to build something and we built it. And I remember when my friend went off that, he went as fast as he could for the first time and he hit that thing and he flew like a rag doll through the air, landed on the ground, smacked his head, his chin bleeding, skateboard lands on him and we just thought, yeah, no, that's a bad ramp. We're not supposed to go on that thing. I was smart enough to go, yeah, we built something. I don't think we built something that I wanna go on. You can build your life how you want. If you don't build it on God's word, it's not something worth building. Noah got his directions from the Lord, and he allowed the Lord to direct his life, not just to build the boat, but to build his life. Can you imagine how bad it would have been for Noah if he had to try to build something without the Lord's help? Proverbs 19, 16 says, He who obeys instructions guards his life. I love Psalms 40, verse 8. It says, I take joy in doing your will, my God, for your instructions are written on my heart. Psalms 19, 7 says, the instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. When we give our lives over to God's word and his instructions, there is life and there is help and there is hope in what we're building because we're not building it the way we think. We're building it the way God already knows how we need to build. And so receiving instructions from God's word is the first step. But guess what? Receiving the instructions is not the, the, is not the last part. It's not the only part. When we receive it, we have to go and do it. We have to obey what has been told. Noah, it says he did everything the Lord commanded. What if Noah said, I'm only going to do 75%? How'd you like to get that boat out on the storm 35 days in and you go, oh, I forgot to build that part right. And so it wasn't just part, it was all of it. I want you to know, we don't get points for partial obedience. My kids always think that somehow I'm happy when they partially obey what I've asked them to do. Clean your room, and they clean half of it. And I go, what happened? You didn't clean your room? They go, well, I cleaned half of it. Well, guess what? That's not all of it. I'm not happy with partial obedience. Partial obedience is still disobedience. And I think sometimes we go, man, well, I partially, you know, hey, I hey at least I obeyed God over here a little bit or kind of over here, well, I did some of it, that's great. But you know what? Partial obedience is disobedience. God doesn't want part of us, he wants all of us. 
And I'm not saying we're not going to make mistakes and mess up, but our life should be committed to the fact I want to do what God says, not just sit here and listen to God's word and listen to what he says. James 1.22 says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. Deuteronomy 12.28 says, be careful to obey all of my commandments so that it will go well with you and your children after you because you will be doing what is good and pleasing to the Lord your God. Do you know that when you obey all of God's commandments and you commit your life to obeying him in all your ways, it doesn't just bless you. It says it will bless your children and your children after you. I, I pray and I, I, I hope and I pray and I believe God that the way I live my life won't just be a blessing to me, but to my children, my grandchildren, my great grandchildren. That I won't just hear God's word and not be changed by it, but that I'll hear God's word, I'll receive his instruction, and then I'll go and do it. Why? Because I want to build my life in a way that it counts. Here's another thing about Noah that I think is important for us to know this morning as you're listening and watching this. Is a godly father or a godly person builds a life that will impact others. My life is not just for myself. It will impact others. Others. Hebrews 11, verse 7 again, I read it, but let me read it one more time. It says, By faith, Noah, when warned about things not seen, in holy fear built an ark and saved his family. It says he built an ark. And because he was obedient to the Lord and in faith, he, he built something that would save his family. It protected and it saved them in a world of evil, in a world of corruption, in a world of violence, in a world that was dark, in a world that wanted nothing to do with God. In that type of world, Noah built something and it impacted his whole family. And for years while he's building that boat, for years while he's, he's building, think about the conversations he's having with his sons. Think about the conversations he's having with people. You don't think he built a boat that big and it didn't get the attention of people around him? As a matter of fact, it says in 2 Peter, it says the whole time that he was building the boat, it says in 2 Peter 2, verse 5, Noah was warning the world of God's righteous judgment. Do you know that Noah was, was warning and preaching every day to the people as they would come and look at what are you building and why are you doing this? It says he was a prophet to his nation, to his generation. And while he's building while he's hammering, whatever he was doing to put the boat together. You know what I think of? I think of the conversations he was having with his sons. I was thinking about how he wasn't just building a boat, but he was trying to build godly sons. He was trying to build a godly legacy. He was trying to build something that would impact his family and impact anyone who would listen. He was trying to show his sons and others not just how to build a boat, but how to obey God how to trust God and put your hope in God. There's destruction coming. There's a storm coming, but put your hope in the Lord. I've got the answer. And that's how we should be living our lives, not just trying to build something but, but with our own lives, but build something that impacts others, that helps people get rescued and saved from the storm and the destruction of sin in our lives. Are we building something that's impacting other people or are we just trying to build our own lives and my own savings account and my own little, you know, my own dreams? I don't know that this was Noah's dream, but this is what God had for him. And so he built it and it impacted other people. A lot of them didn't listen, but, but, but it impacted them still. It took years, decades for him to build this. He just kept on working. He just kept on enduring. How many people came and made fun of him? How many people didn't listen? How many times did his son say, man, we got to do this again. We got to keep building this. And the whole time he stayed faithful and he kept building. Dads, fathers, everyone listening, I want you to know this. If you're going to build something with your life that impacts others, it's going to require endurance. You are going to have to keep pressing through. There are just going to be some days that you go, I can't quit. I can't give up. This is tough. But I am going to keep doing what God has called me to do. I am going to keep living righteous, even in a world that is full of unrighteousness. I am going to build my life on God's word because I'm building something that isn't just for me. It's going to bless others. 
it's going to impact others. A godly home, a godly environment, a ministry, a business. Ne never underestimate what you can build with your life and how it will impact others. One of the things that I love about Noah and Sharice, if you'll get ready to come back as I, I'm going to close this down here. Noah's name means comfort. His name means comfort. It says in Genesis 5, verse 29, and he, meaning Noah's dad, and he called his name Noah, saying, this one will comfort us. The name of Noah sounds like the Hebrew word for comfort. They're very similar. When Noah's father named him, he gave him that name. That way it would remind him of his purpose. Names are very important in, in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. In Hebrew names, they mean something. And in a world of chaos, God wanted Noah to build something with his life that could bring comfort for his family and for anyone who would listen. Does your life bring comfort in a world of chaos? I was thinking about that this week and looking at our world and it's so chaotic. There's so many things going on. I thought, does my life bring comfort to my kids right now? Does my faith, the way I live and the way I walk with the Lord, does it bring comfort to my neighbors? Are my words bringing comfort even to you right now? Am I living my life the way Noah lived where it can bring comfort in a world that is chaotic and full of chaos? It is the heartbeat of God to comfort his children. And I think we should have the same desire, the same heartbeat to comfort people, especially right now. I want to live my life like Noah, that it impacts others. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 3, it says this, in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is so merciful. He is the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all of our troubles. Listen, He comforts us in all of our troubles. Why? It says, so we can comfort others. You say, Paul, I'm not building a boat. I'm not building a ministry. I know, I know. But you are building a life. And God says, I'm going to comfort you. And I'm going to help you. And I'm going to give you what you need. Why? So you can go and help someone else. So you can comfort someone else. So that you can be a blessing to someone else. So that you can be a voice like Noah and say, there's a storm coming. Can't you see it? Don't you see the storm? It's there. And I've got the answer. Can you comfort can you pray? Can you witness? Can you do something with your life that will impact others? If we're going to live a godly life, if we're going to be godly people, if you're going to be a godly father, you've got to build a life that impacts others. It's not just about you. It's not just about me. I've had a lot of conversations the last couple of months really about the future. Anyone out there been talking about the future? Maybe your conversations sound like mine. A lot of questions of uncertainty about the future. What is school going to look like for my kids? We don't know right now. There's all these things they're talking about. What is church going to look, look like now that we're coming back? And what do we got to do to come back? And all those things. We've been asking those questions. What is our government going to do? Every week it's different. Uncertainty. What is the future? What does the future hold? What are they gonna? What are they gonna do in the in the fall? What are they gonna do in the wintertime when 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 the, you know uh, flu season hits? Future. My mind's just been racing, just been racing, wondering and wondering and wondering. The future. What are we gonna do? A lot of uncertainty about the future. I think this is kind of why I love the life of Noah. I was thinking about this. This is part of the reason why I wanted to talk about Noah today. Because I see a wonderful reminder in the life of Noah about uncertainty in the future. It says again in Hebrews 11, 7 about Noah, when he heard God's warning about the future, Noah believed him even though there were no signs of a flood. 
Noah was warned by God about the future. And he believed him. He had faith to believe, even though there was no sign of a flood. There was no natural signs anywhere. I like that God speaks to Noah about the future. He tells him what he needs to know, how to build his life to impact his family. The future. Do you know that God is ready to help you with the future? Do you know that God has already thought about your future, that he's already seen it, he already knows what tomorrow holds? I love that old saying, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know the one who holds tomorrow. Do you know that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Do you know that God doesn't love Noah and his family more than you and yours? He's thought about our future. As a matter of fact, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord's plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. God has hope for your future. And maybe all you can see right now is hopelessness. Maybe in your life you look around and all you see is you don't see a future, but I want you to know God is ready to help you with your future. He already knows what tomorrow brings. And he warned Noah. And Jesus said, it will be as it was in the days of Noah. And I've given you my words. And I've given you my presence. And I've given you my spirit. And I've given you my direction so that you can have hope and help for the future. Jesus wants to help you. Matter of fact, Jesus said it this way. It's such a great verse for where we're at. It says in John 16, verse 32, The Father is with me, and I've told you all of this, so that trusting in me, you will be unshakable and assured, deeply at peace. Just like Pastor Shekinah was praying a minute ago. Deeply at peace. In this godless world, you will continue to experience difficulties. But take heart, I've conquered the world. In this life, you're going to have difficulties. Your future, I can guarantee you, I'm not even really a prophet, but you're going to have problems in the future. Jesus says, it's okay. Take heart. Don't be shaken. I've already overcome the world. When you walk with me, you walk in victory. One last thought here. God did not rescue Noah and his family out of the storm. Sometimes it's just good to, rem to remind ourselves of this story that Noah and his family had to go through the storm. I always like it when God just rescues you out of the storm. But a lot of times having faith in the Lord is going to help you have the strength to get through the storm. And so God saved Noah and his family. Noah's going to end up in Hebrews 11 in the New Testament in the Hall of Faith because he believed, because he walked with the Lord. And in his day and in his generation, he was a righteous man. And that's how God wants us to live. Righteous, walking with the, the Lord, walking with him, closely in relationship with him. And wherever you are, whoever's listening to this, I want to challenge you. I'm going to say a prayer in just a moment. It's a simple prayer that we pray every week here. Harvest Community Church exists to help people discover a loving God. We want you to know God loves you. Jesus loves you. God loved you so much he gave his one and only son, Jesus, to die on the cross, not so that we would die or perish, but so that we could have everlasting life. Jesus loves you. and He wants to help you. I want to pray for you. And wherever you're at, if you're not right with the Lord, if you haven't given your life to, the, to, to God, maybe you're, like, you, you're not really walking close at all. Noah walked with the Lord, but you're going, man, it's been so far. Do you know for 500 years Noah lived and we don't really hear anything about what he did? And then when all of a sudden he's 500 years old, we hear that he's walking with the Lord and he starts to build the boat. You know what that tells me? It's not how you start. It's how you finish. Maybe for years you haven't really done anything. You haven't been walking with the Lord. Now is your time. I want to pray for you. And I'm going to ask you to repeat these words. I'm going to say a prayer and I'm going to ask you to repeat it right where you are. It's a simple prayer asking Jesus into your heart to change your life so you can surrender your life and receive his. Wherever you are, say these words with me right now. I'm going to just close my eyes and say it. Repeat these words. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me. Change me. Make me new. 
Lord, I surrender all that I am so I can receive all that you are. Forgive me and take all of me. And like Noah, help me to walk with you and to build my life in a way that impacts others. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you said that prayer, we want to connect with you. We want to follow up with you. Please hit the connect button uh, or I said that prayer button and, and, and fill out that or call the office. We want to pray with you and help you in your next steps with the Lord. And to all the dads out there, to all the fathers on Father's Day, and maybe you're a single father, you're, I want to pray for you. You know what? Maybe you're a mom and you're a single mom. I grew up with a single mom. I know that struggle. To the moms, the single moms, to the fathers, I want to pray a blessing over you on this Father's Day, asking God to help you as you continue to be the person that God's called you to be. Heavenly Father, I pray a blessing right now over every father, every single mother, every person that's listening to this. I pray, Lord, on this Father's Day that we would be reminded of you, the greatest father of all. Lord, that you, Lord, would give them strength, courage, Help them to have that same spirit as Noah, Lord, to go against the grain of this culture, to stand for truth in a dark and evil world. Lord, I pray right now that we would be the Father. Help, Lord, those mothers who are having to do both roles. I pray right now, Lord, for strength and courage and wisdom to raise up godly children. Help us to be the people you've called us to be. May we continue to live for you and walk with you every day. Thank you for this message. May those words stay with us this week as we go about our lives. We give you glory. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, friends.